Following off from the last week's episode about famous haunted spots in Korea, I'm going to introduce you one more place this week. In Gyeongsan City, Gyeongsangbukdo, not far from Daegu, is what people refer as the glasses factory. As the name implies, there used to be a factory that produced glasses. The abandoned factory building was rumored to be a haunted hot spot, first attracting students from the nearby university and then gradually from all over the country as it won internet notoriety. As usually the case with such a spot, there are spooky backstories about the place floating around, which roughly goes like this. On the plot was first a textile factory which was plagued with mysterious fire outbreaks. In the end the business collapsed and the owner killed himself. Next was a shoe factory but met more or less similar end. The last was the glasses factory but the owner went mad and set fire at the dormitory for factory workers, which ended killing 21 people, including the owner himself. And as usual with such rumors, it's not true. The factory belonged to the first producer of glasses frames in the country. The business was pretty successful for decades but didn't survive the nationwide financial crisis in 1997 as many of the small mid-sized businesses at the time. Otherwise, there were no mad owner or the fire. But for once, this supposedly haunted spot actually has a horrible history, much, much worse than the rumored fire that killed 20. To understand what happened, unfortunately, I have to give you a little history lesson that goes back to 1945. After World War II, Japan left Korea, and the Korean Peninsula was occupied by the Soviets in the northern half and the US troops in the southern half. For them, Korea was just a former part of Japan and saw no problem splitting the country regardless of their history and national identity. And by 1948, Korea formally splitted with separate governments in the North and South, backed by the Soviets and the US, respectively. For pro-US government in South Korea, the presence of communist sympathizers was a headache, and came up with the idea of so-called the National Podo League. The former communists in the country were encouraged to declare themselves and voluntarily join the Podo League. The League shall re-educate them and would protect the members from the disadvantages they might face as a former communists. But in truth, the League was not only more of a surveillance target, but its list of people was falsely fabricated from the beginning. The government officers were under pressure to fill up the quota for the list, and the result were people forced to sign up just because one of their family members was a communist, or ordinary people with no idea what communism was, lured to sign themselves in for the promise of a bag of rice or pocket money. Nobody can be sure how much of the League was true former communists, but the general consensus is at least the majority of people who signed up to the League was not. And all hell broke with the Korean War in 1950. South Korean government was paranoid with the idea of enemy within and the members of the Podo League was an easy target with their identity and addresses clearly listed. All over the country, people were taken away from their homes just because their name was on the Podo League and were killed without even a charade of trial. The number of the victims who were murdered by their own government this way is estimated somewhere from 100,000 up to over a million. Now, back to the glasses factory. At the back of the factory ground is what looks like an opening of a cave. It's actually the opening of a former cobalt mine, which was developed and operated during the Japanese occupation. 
and this former mine was one of many stages of the massacre of Podo League members. It is believed more than 3,000 people were shot or thrown off down the vertical tunnel of the mine. It is said the water that ran downstream of the mine was tainted red for full one year afterwards. The series of dictators post-Korean War didn't want to recognize the massacre. In the following decades, what really happened was forgot. Just the spooky rumors about a cave full of human skulls floated around, which subsequently sipped to the old factory building in front of the mine. It was only in 2005, with a liberal-leaning government in place, that the massacre was finally recognized by the government. Part of the numerous human remains were exhumed from the mine, but a lot still remains down there. The old factory building itself is refurbished now and operates as a convalescent hospital. It is a sad side of Korea's modern history, how a scene of massacre was forgotten and filtered down as an amusing haunted spot to explore in the public's mind. But then, if any place should be haunted, there would be nowhere more likely than where thousands of people were killed not even knowing why they had to die. Probably for that reason, I came across many more stories about the so-called glasses factory than about any other infamous sad haunted spots I introduced last week. So, here are five of such allegedly true stories but for once, I ask of you, give your little thought to the victims regarding to the place as you enjoy the stories today. As always, handpicked, translated and narrated by your host, Anthony. One summer day, I and my gang of friends were discussing what exciting thing there was to do. We decided to explore the glasses factory. There used to be a glasses factory, obviously, but now abandoned. Rumors circulated it was also a site of mass killing during the Korean War and had some reputation for paranormal sightings. Next evening, a friend brought his car to pick me and two other friends to our adventure. We had a bit of a difficulty to find a way, it was time before Google Map or the likes, so made us stop at a convenient store to buy some snacks and inquire the direction. Can you tell us the way to the glasses factory? The owner of the store, a middle-aged lady, lost a smile upon hearing the glasses factory. Why do you ask? We laughed and casually said, <laughs> It's summer, we want some spooky adventure. The lady's face was still grim and mumbled as if to herself, Better not. And didn't seem to want to give us the direction. But we managed to find a way nonetheless by calling another friend who knew the direction. Tucked away in the quiet corner surrounded by mountains, there was nobody around. There were no street lamps, so we used the flashlights we brought with us. We didn't see any ghosts on the factory side, so we just joked around. Now looking further out from the factory, we found what looked like the entrance of a cave. I remember the rumor that in this cave, many civilians were killed during the war. We were about to walk in when I received a text message from an unknown number. It read, Stop there. I suddenly felt chills all over me, gripped by an oppressive fear. I asked the gang if any of them had sent this prank text. But two had left their phones in the car, another was on the phone, and the last had lost the signal. I persuaded the gang to turn back to the car. On the way back to the car, I came up with the idea that the friend who gave us the direction to the glasses factory 
might be the culprit. I called him up and shouted, Is it so funny to prank us, eh? But he denied the accusation. Suddenly some dogs were barking somewhere. What's that noise? The friend on the phone asked. I don't know, some dogs barking, I said. No, that's not a dog. It sounds like somebody crying, he said. Uh, knock it off. Nevertheless, we all started running to the car. We passed a small hut that we hadn't noticed earlier. It was covered with ropes and paper talismans. Who sent me the strange text? Who was it crying in the dark? I'm still not sure. It happened almost a year ago. After graduating high school, I stayed in my little hometown while most of my close friends went to university in Daegu. I found myself fairly lonely being left alone for the first time in years, so one weekend I visited them in Daegu. Two of my friends' colleagues also joined, so us five had a nice reunion with usual drinks. When we all got pleasantly tipsy, my friend talked about this haunted factory site not far from the university. I didn't really believe in such things, but he, as if to challenge me, suggested that we all should visit there when we finish the bottles. I didn't care much about ghosts or whatever, but thought why not make some fun memory with all the buddies, and agreed. As we walked through the winding road up to the supposed spot, quite a few people were coming down the way. I just assumed it should be already so famous. Suddenly, a female colleague of my friend's started whining that she was really scared and that we'd better quit the idea. But we were five of us, and most of us were still more skeptical. The factory site had indeed eeriness in the air. At the entrance were the signs saying not to trespass the private ground. All the windows were broken in and papers or clothes were fluttering through the broken glasses. Past the factory building was a cave in which civilians were massacred during Korean War. The entrance of it was barred with iron gate, and in front of it was small memorial monument. It was there strange things started. The girl who said she was scared suddenly insisted we get into the cave. She seemed to have forgot how she'd been hiding behind us up until a few minutes ago, and now kept insisting excitedly. We tried to persuade her, saying it was locked, maybe another time when there's more people. What do you mean? There are a lot of people here now. One, two, three, four, eight people are here, she said. We were spooked and looked around the empty space. Finally, my friend said we should take her back down. But before we could pass the factory building, she dropped on the ground and started pleading for help, holding onto my leg. Her grip was strong like from a really desperate person, and I realized something was terribly wrong. A friend volunteered to run down to catch a taxi. Suddenly, another friend started screaming that he saw somebody at the window of the building looking at him. He then started walking back to the cave, all stiffened up like a robot. We went all breathless with panic. Taxi came up about 30 minutes later, which felt like forever. The taxi driver scolded us coming to play at such a place. We put the girl and the friend in the taxi and asked the driver to bring them to their dormitory, and the rest of us walked back. By the time we got back, the girl was still not herself. 
Several guys were struggling to keep her still by putting down her arms and legs, but whenever she moved, the guys were pushed up and down. I was so frightened with the whole situation and just kept myself small at one corner. Soon, an older student was brought in. He was said to have some spiritual power and that he nearly had become a shaman. He set himself down above the girl's head and talked to her, first gently, but soon sternly shouted, Now, get out of there! His reasoning and threatening continued a while, and then the girl finally responded, I'll go! I'm going! in a deep male voice. Shortly after, she seemed to get herself back. The older student got hold of sea salt and sprinkled it around the room and on us. He explained us that the first day of month and at about four in the morning, spirits become most active and the girl was possessed by one such a spirit. That was supposedly end of our ordeal that night, but everybody involved further suffered insomnias or sleep paralysis, if from sheer trauma. I won't insist anyway there's a ghost, but having experienced it myself, I cannot but think there's something more in the world than what meets the eyes. I live in Taegu. One summer evening, I got together with friends from high school. When we all got tipsy, the topic turned to horror stories, and one of them suddenly asked, Hey, why don't we visit that old glasses factory? I didn't feel like it, but all the others were up for it. So we drove, <laughs> drunken drive it was, I'm sorry, to the famed old factory. Time was heading to the midnight. There were four of us and we decided to have two looking inside the building while the other two waited in the car just in case something goes wrong. They should call police or help if the first two fail to come out in 30 minutes. And well, I lost a rock, paper and scissors and ended up exploring the building with one other friend. The abandoned building was indeed spooky, but there wasn't anything special. We just had small talks while walking around the ground, peed at one corner as the nature called, and then were going upstairs when the friend abruptly stopped in the mid-sentence. I looked back to find him just blankly looking ahead. Hey, that's not funny, come on, I said but he didn't respond. I shook and shouted at him to no avail. Gripped by fear, I even swore at him, but he didn't move at all. And then suddenly he started marching forward up the stairs and into the darkness. I tried to stop him by blocking his way or pulling his hands, but he just pushed me away. Maybe it was just my fear, but it felt like he was much stronger than usual. In the end, he disappeared upstairs, and I rushed down to call the other friends outside. But before I could get out, I encountered four figures walking in. Ghosts? I screamed. But well, it turned out friends who were waiting indeed called police officers when we failed to return in 30 minutes. I explained them what happened and searched through the building. The missing friend was found on the second floor. He was sleeping there on some sort of table. When we woke him up, he seemed remembering nothing. We were reprimanded by the police officers, but I was happy enough that nobody was hurt. When I got back home, my dad was sleeping on the sofa with a TV still on. By the way, my dad is not quite a professional shaman, but he does have sixth sense. I quietly sneaked in as not to wake him up, but he opened his eyes as I passed him. 
Where were you? He said. Shit, might the police called him? Uh, I'm sorry, Dad. I got involved with the police, but it's not that I did anything wrong. I said. I'm not talking about that. Did you visit some odd place? He said. Well, it was no use to lie to him, so I explained everything that happened. Dad insisted that I should call in the friend who got weird earlier, like right away. Already knowing what my dad is, the friend came by. Dad had us standing side by side, and then tapped our heads with、uh, some sort of dried codfish for good twenty minutes each, and bit harder on my friend than me. After the weird ritual, he explained that some spirits attached themselves to us and followed us back. Don't you ever do such a dumb thing again. Was his last word. A story I heard from a friend. One summer night, he and three other friends spontaneously visited a famous glasses factory in Gyeongsan. What's better than a bit of spooky exploration at a boring, muggy summer night? They thought. By the time they looked around the abandoned factory ground, it was already passing midnight. Well, here's nothing really. Let's have a look at the cave where people were killed. A friend nonchalantly said. So four guys jumped back on the car and drove around the factory towards the old cobalt mine. But as soon as they arrived, my friend got strange sense of creeps. Call me a chicken, I don't care. I don't feel like going," said he, and decided to stay in the car and wait with another friend who happened to get a call from his girlfriend while the other two carrying on with their exploration. About five minutes later, my friend heard footsteps approaching. Were they back already? Indeed, he looked at the rearview mirror and saw his friends hooping back on the car. They were not themselves, saying they saw something and should get out of there quickly. My friend was already feeling spooked enough, so he stepped on the pedal without further question. While driving down the narrow road, his phone rang. It was from. One of the friends who went to see the mine. Just said, if you have anything to say, why bother calling right from the back seat? My friend said and looked back. It was empty. He quickly picked up the phone, and his friends shouted on the other side of the line, "Why he left them there? Quit the silly prank and come back to pick them up." And later, the two friends who went to see the cobalt mine told their side of the story. So they went up to the opening of the old mine, and saw two red dots. Momentarily surprised, but it turned out two guys having a smoke there. One friend exaggeratedly asked them, as if to shake off the spook he felt, "Did you see anything?" It was too dark to make out their faces, but one of them replied, "Nothing much." Before the French could approach, the guys put out their cigarettes and moved on, saying they should go or something like that. Two friends just shrugged, looked inside the mine through the metal cage door, and lit cigarettes just like the guys earlier. When they heard a car starting and driving away. What were the guys that his friend saw? Who were they that my friend saw? It remains the mystery the four friends would still talk about whenever they get together. A close friend of mine told me this. Some years ago, he and three of his friends visited the old glasses factory. 
It's well known as a haunted spot in Tegu region, if not nationwide. Apparently, that particular night seemed a perfect day for such a spooky exploration. It gloomily drizzled just the right amount. On the way, they even played some low-key music on the car radio to fully immerse themselves into the experience. But as soon as the car turned a sharp corner into the narrow lane that led to the factory ground, the two friends at the back seat shouted to stop in unison. They both claimed that they felt lightning hunch that they shouldn't go. My friend and the other who was sitting on the passenger seat teased them that they were chickening out. What was all this fuss coming all the way? Should they turn back now? After some back and forth, they decided to push on on the condition that they would turn back as soon as anything odd should occur. About five minutes later, they reached a small village. It was just about seven or eight in the evening, but strangely, they could not see a single light on in any of the houses. The whole village seemed empty and silent, apart from the orange street lamps and the sound of falling raindrops. They weren't sure how to find the factory, and there wasn't anybody to ask either. Hitting a crossroad, they hopped out of the car, split themselves into two teams to check out the both directions. So my friend teamed up with a friend who sat on the passenger seat to take one road. And the two from the back seat took the other. But not long after, my friend heard one of them screaming from the other side, and soon met by the sight of the two friends running back down with ashen face. They jumped back on the car and urged, "Let's get out of here! Go, go, go!" They seemed so desperate that my friend and the other friend could not say anything, but turned back the car first. On the way back to Tegu Town, they made a stop at a convenient store to ask what that was about. So the friends from the back seat followed one road, and soon they met a sign for Fatima Nursing Hospital, and walked further towards the direction. When they turned a the corner in the dim lamplight, they saw somebody standing. It was a slender woman with a short bobcut hair, and in a white shirt. They first just thought, "Gosh, she scared us. What's she doing there?" But soon realized something was odd. She wasn't even carrying an umbrella in the drizzling rain. And kept glaring at them. And when she opened her mouth, even though there was still significant distance between them, her voice whispered right in their ears, saying, "Here,、yeah, came to watch us." The friend's throat stuck on the spot. The woman whispered again. Bring the other two here too. Now totally panicked, one of them pulled the other and ran back down. As they were getting away, her voice rang right in their ears once again, but now screeching. Wow! <laughs> so fast! So much you want to live? <laughs> Maybe it's just a lingering trauma. But one of the two still claims he hears her voice occasionally, saying, "I know where you are. Come back with your friends." Hi, it's Anthony here, and thank you very much for your listening. I've already talked about several sad chapters from Korea's modern history, but today's episode was probably the most disturbing one, at least for me. It is truly sad that none of the people responsible for the massacre ever met justice. 
I really hope the souls of the victims find peace and the old glasses factory ground finally shed off its sad reputation. If you enjoyed my work, please give it a like, comment and consider subscribing to my channel. I'll come back with something new next week. Until then, stay safe and take care.